Mr. Daniels, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Wealthy Educator returning with another episode. I'm actually very excited about this interview. But before we get to that, please be sure to head over to YouTube and subscribe to the Wealthy Educator. Also, share this live video and be sure to check out the previous interviews on the YouTube channel. Today, I have a very, very special guest, Mr. Anton Daniels. He What's happening, fam? <laughs> He's a social media expert and influencer, a user experience expert and practitioner, an entrepreneur. He has over 70,000 social media subscribers and over 5 million YouTube views. He's also very, very well versed in financial success. I'm going to have to update those numbers, bro. Uh, say it again. I'm gonna have to update those numbers. More like a hundred, hundred thousand. Oh, Is that right? Hundred thousand subs, eight million. Oh my eight goodness! Million. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got I'm some old information. Right uh, that's cool. That's all <laughs> on me. That's all on me. So, no, it's all good, man. Everybody should probably grab a pen and a pad because he's definitely gonna be dropping some knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Anton Daniels. Mr. What's Mr. Daniels, you good? How you doing, man? I, I am phenomenal. See, now you're you about to make me pull out the Rolexes now. I got to get out the green boxes. <laughs> I got to switch from the Apple Watch to the Rolexes. <laughs> oh, you do it like that, man? Yeah, we're going to do it a little differently today, so it's all right. <laughs> you got you to you flex on me today, huh? Not on you. I just want to inspire the people. I just want to ensure that they understand that. I am the greatest C student of all time. <laughs> hey, I'm and glad you mentioned that because we probably we could, we could probably dive into a little bit of uh, stuff talk about community college. Cause I did watch that video today. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. If they can afford the Rolex, that's a good thing. That's cool. Absolutely. Hey, man. So go ahead and tell the viewers a little bit about yourself, man. So, um, born in Detroit, Michigan, straight out of the slum, so to speak, and to a larger extent, I think that. Um, the things that I've been able to endure through in my short life, because I'm still under 40, I just turned 39. But the, the interesting thing about it is that I think that my life story and, and what we highlight in society is clashing because often at times I see people say stuff like, well, you know, wealth is quiet or, um, money is silent. People that really have money you know, they don't really talk about it or anything like that. And that's not true. That's not true. It's just that the overwhelming majority of people aren't in the rooms to be able to hear how loud this money really is. When you in these social circles and you in these spaces, people that have resources, they are very, very loud. And, and that is the absolute truth. So the, the thing that I want to highlight about my journey and my life, um, just as an introduction, so to speak, and then you can ask me whatever question. My whole life is an open book. But the thing that I want to highlight is just that I was very much a C student and that um, and I tell my daughter and my, my wife and all of the different people that I coach all the time is that um, I just I really wanted to be successful. I just didn't want to do it in the ways that was championed within our culture. Often at times is that you have to be a basketball player. Or you got to be a rapper. And I think that more people should be celebrated. That is doing it the legal and the traditional way in which. Um, you know, I went to a regular high school in Detroit. Um, I wind up, I went one semester into a, a big college. I didn't like the the debt that came along with it. So I paid that off immediately. Um, I got a really good job. My brother had got me a job in a plant in Detroit. And then 
Um, eventually I got fired from there right before the recession. So I went broke. I was married. I had a kid on the way. And so I lost everything. And I mean, when I say I lost everything, all my cars got repossessed. I moved back in my parents' basement, the whole nine yards, 10, 12 years later, I'm richer than, than ever. You know what I'm saying? Trying to become a DECA millionaire. So the point, the point that I'm making, and, and we can dive into the details obviously, but um, to just start off, the point that I'm making is that if I'm able to do it as a C student, is no reason in the world why you can't take the exact blueprint that I'm given on a daily daily basis and copy it and implement it and do it for yourself. It's all about being intentional. Absolutely. That's some good stuff, man. So I, I have paid a lot of attention to some of your videos and I saw that you were married approximately 16 years, correct? Yep. 17 years in June. 17. Congratulations on that. I'll be 16 in July. Congratulations, fam. Hey, hey, appreciate that, man. Appreciate they that. They don't like to celebrate it. I talk about marriage and the, and the business behind marriage and all of that, too. They don't like yeah. to talk about that. Hey, I, it's something we need to talk about. Those are the dis discussions we need to have. Absolutely. Because I think you give a lot of your success to your wife. Tell us about that. Well, the thing that people don't realize is that to a large extent, and one of the reasons why I think that our culture and our community isn't successful when it comes to relationships is because they don't understand the business of marriage. Now, marriage is very much based in love, right? It, it's it's the foundation of it has to be something stronger than just what you look like or, you know, um, how you feel about the person because feelings are fleeting. And as we grow and as we evolve, most people don't understand that you change and as you change and as you grow, that does not mean that the person that you're with is a bad person, but you can grow in two different directions if you're not equally yoked. So the whole idea behind it is that the foundation of marriage has to be more than what you see with your eyes or what you feel with your heart. It has to be greater than that. And that's why I always labeled it the business of marriage and that, you know, it's things that are stronger than how you feel about something at that specific moment that could that should drive the success of everything that you do and it should extend into every part of your life. So the thing that I realized very early is that um, women to a larger extent are smarter than us, much faster than us. Like even in history, if you look at it, if you look at the chessboard, so to speak, right? It's the reason why, because the chessboard is a reflection of history. The chessboard highlights the power of women as far as their ability to be able to provide insight and help you. It's the reason why they call it help meets, help you level up, right? Mm -hmm. They aren't as strong as us, but they are just as intelligent as, as us. So that's where the wisdom comes in. And so I attribute a lot of my success as far as me being able to leverage the intelligence of my wife, leverage her, leverage her ability to get in certain rooms and, and develop certain friendships, which we ultimately, um, you know, created a network of people that we wound up doing business with to a larger extent her ability to give me her insight and information as it relates to certain businesses that I started. I give a, a lot of that credit to her and her ability to buy into what we do, not just from a love and relationship perspective, but the business of marriage also. Yeah. And marriage definitely is a business. Obviously it has a lot to do with love, but it also has a lot to do with, with business. And absolutely. I give credit to my wife all the time. Like there's a lot of things she has encouraged me to do. And if it wasn't for her, I definitely would not be in a position I'm in right now. Absolutely. And, you, know, we, I, you know, we're headed towards financial independence and, you know, hopefully I get here sooner than later. But without her, I don't know where I would be financially. Yeah. You know, so I, I absolutely do appreciate you, you you mentioning the business side of marriage because a lot of people don't see it. Like You'd be surprised how many guys have reached out to me like, yo, I'm so glad that you are not on the extreme side of the manosphere as far as highlighting or pushing for hate towards the opposite sex. No, I just believe in holding people accountable at the same time of evolving and growing financially and emotionally and, and from a character perspective. So I just like to be objective. I don't lean one way or the other. I try to be very temperate in the things that I do, but at the same time, I think it's important to highlight the the uncomfortable conversations or discussions that we often like to ignore as far as being able to really develop who we are as a character and then have that translate into every other aspect of our life. You're absolutely right. And I can appreciate that, man. So you, your wife has been a stay at home mom since y'all been married, right? My wife has not worked not since we've been married. So when we first met, when we first got married, um, she was already working um, and she was, you know, she was just busy. She was just doing 
doing her thing, but we had already established that when we had our daughter, which was over 13 years ago, that she was going to stop working, focus on being a mother, and then evolve based off of whatever it is that she found was best for her as far as her truly living in her femininity, figuring out what her purpose is, all of that. So, you know, we didn't want to raise our daughter in a daycare. We didn't want to do any anything related to that. And I, it forced me also to develop an insane worth it, work ethic. So my, my wife hasn't worked in over 13 years. Now she's um, decided to go into nursing because that's like her whole, her lifelong passion. So, you know, she's in nursing school and our daughter, now that our daughter is a lot older and, you know, she's kind of developing into her own purpose and all that other type of stuff. But no, my wife hasn't worked in over 13 years. Man. Aside from, aside from the different business ventures, she's assisting me in a lot of that stuff, but not a formal job. Absolutely not. No way. Man, much respect to you. Much respect for that, man. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. So tell us about your upbringing, like as it relates to financial awareness. For example, did you grow up learning about investing or did you kind of come from a school of hard knocks or what? No. Nah, so um, I was blessed to go to both a public and a private school. I went to a very esteemed private school, but that only came as a result of my parents recognizing my intelligence and me getting into a lot of trouble and them saying, oh, no, nah, you're not going down that path. So my dad made the sacrifice. He drove a beater around. He he did whatever he had to do. My parents very much made the sacrifice. I grew up with both of my parents in my household. Um, they made the sacrifice in sending me and my brother to, brothers to private school. So, you know, they realized, OK, we not going to get rich. We probably not going to be the ones, but we have to make a sacrifice so that we can ensure that our sons and I got three other brothers, our sons wound up breaking that generational curse um, that we have within our culture and our community that says we have to be consumers or we have to work in a plan or whatever like that. Right. So my exposure to wealth came as a result of going to private school and being sent to private school as a result of getting in trouble when I was a youth. So I got sent to private school when I was in middle school and I quickly learned that being smart was cool. Whereas in the regular schools, being smart was dumb. Or you got teased for being smart, whereas you got celebrated and being stupid was the thing that you got teased for if you wanted to be, you know, a, a, a butthole, so to speak. So um, I realized, you know, I started getting exposed to and having friends and going to a lot of these homes and parties where they had over 16 and 17 bedrooms. I had never seen no crap like that before. Like I had never, you know, been exposed to the idea that they were talking about financial freedom and you know, they were driving to school and BMWs and all of that stuff. And it just absolutely fascinated me because every day when I went home, you know, I would walk home from school and catch the bus. I was exposed to that other side of what I realized that I no longer wanted to be a part of, mm -hmm. you know. And so my exposure came at a very early age and my brothers also and that we no longer wanted to align ourselves with what, what we was, you know, taught as far as our society is what was a cultural norm. So it was a kind of a clash, you know, it was a struggle for a while, but that exposure was my, was my introduction into financial success and freedom in which it, you know, it helped me to leapfrog everybody else. And that when I did go back to public school and I went to a really good public school in high school, um, I had to test to get in there and everything like that. But when I did go back, it didn't matter how smart I was at that point. I was already, in tune with what I what other people didn't know at an early age, which propelled me to be a lot more successful as far as making the sacrifices, because I knew other things that other people didn't know at that point. Yes, sir. Was Jordan's, so Jordan's didn't mean anything to me. Yeah. I, like I didn't care about becoming like I didn't care about. I, I like to use this analogy a lot. I never wanted to be a basketball player after that point. Yeah. Like when I seen the Cleveland Cavaliers and LeBron and all of them, everybody was fawning over LeBron. I was trying to study Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert was my hero, the guy that owned the Cavaliers, the guy that created rocket companies and Quicken Loans and all of that. I wanted to own the team. I never cared about wanting to be the guy at a superstar. And that was my whole thing going forward. Even when I went to college, like my thing was my work study job was in the library. I would mm -hmm. hurry up and finish all of my work and then read everything that I can ever read. Benjamin Graham. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, I studied Trump. 
And a lot of people didn't like, don't like Trump, but I don't care who's president. I don't, that's not going to affect rich people. Yeah. I wanted to understand how he's only paying this amount in taxes, but he's, he's still <laughs> designated as a billionaire. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. my mind works differently than everybody else. The things that interest me is not the stuff that's popular on social media. I understand. So you wanted to learn the system and, and figure out how to be part of it. And how Absolutely. To manage, yeah. How to, how to get the same advantage that other people have gotten. Yep. The people, the people who are where you want to be. Absolutely. And if you're looking at an owner like Dan Gilbert, he has that long money. And, you know, it, LeBron's going to be fine. But even now, you know, he's injured. And he if he got injured the rest of his life, he he couldn't play ball. He wouldn't make any more money as far as basketball is concerned. But Dan Gilbert well, he money until he's not years old. The interesting thing about LeBron versus Dan Gilbert is they both rich, right? Absolutely. But the, but the difference for me was that I have a better chance of becoming Dan Gilbert than I do of LeBron. I'll never run as fast or jump as high. And once I stopped growing past like five, seven, five, eight, it was like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to make it into the league. And <laughs> so you. I'm going to dedicate myself to the things that actually can add value to my life versus the thing that I have to use my body for. And then I also started studying the players. I understood that, you know, NBA players and NFL players, a lot of them go broke five, three to five years after they leave the league. Even the, the small minority of ones that actually make it to have a career longer than three years, let alone make it into the league at all. So none of that stuff ever interested me. None of it. That's, that's understandable. You know, that's understandable. And when I was young, I would hear about people going broke that have made millions of dollars and you don't, you don't, understand how that ever can happen. And then yep. as you get older, you see like they got the hangers on, half of their money is already taxed. So, you know, I, I totally understand now. So I, I can definitely see why you would want to be an owner and take advantage of all the tax loopholes and and just, you know, the fact that you don't have to go out there and actually put on a, a basketball shorts or basketball shoes or anything like that. So yep. you, yep. you have the right mindset, man. Be an owner and not a, you know, not a, a player. You want to own, you want to be the one that's writing the checks. Well, the interesting thing about that, though, also is that's a myth also in that you can't get rich without being an owner or ownership is the way to riches. When in reality, um, and I talk about a lot of small businesses and that I've started a lot, like I've owned restaurants, I've owned web development companies, I've owned applications, I've owned a lot of different businesses. And most people that start businesses are only creating another job for themselves. You know what I'm saying? They're creating a job in which they no longer have PTO. You don't get to take days off now because nobody cares about how you feel. You said you was going to be open at 11 o'clock and close at nine. So we want you open so that you can cook that chicken. Don't For nobody sure. care about how you feel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, ownership is cool, but understanding is better and that people need to understand what they're getting into versus just celebrating the idea of something because I know a lot of millionaires. I coach a lot of millionaires that have never owned a business in their life. Yeah. They were just intentional about how they use their money. And that, that's a great point, man, because I actually, that's one reason why we started this because I was having conversations with a lot of educators and I, I they would, they would put in 40 years, 45 years of work and they couldn't retire. So yep, when yep. they did retire, they were like 65 years old and retired. I know a few that, you know, they retired and a few years later, you know, they can only enjoy two or three years before they pass. And I, I was like, yep, you know what, that, yep. that cannot be me. And I want to try to educate as many people as possible so that they can understand, hey, if you start early investing in a Roth IRA or 403B, yep. you're a millionaire. Yep. So, and yeah, the I, difference to a lot of people, 403B is usually public sector um retirement it's the equivalent of a 401k yes. um tsps for people that are in the military or in service and things like that um and often at times people aren't investing in most institutions and jobs i would say like for example when i when i was working at the university of michigan they had the best match ever they had a double match wow. everything that i contributed they contributed double it's free money and people feel like just because they can't touch it or see it right now that it does not resonate. But I'm telling you, as you get older and I'm less than 40, I know people that I coach like on all ends of the spectrum. I don't just coach millionaires. I coach a lot of different people mm. and retirement is scary. Nobody wants to be required to be a greeter at Walmart in order to make ends meet at the end of the day. So we have to be intentional. And it starts now when people don't truly understand it, the, the, 
the impact of compound interest. Everybody wants to get rich now. Everybody wants to have a hot girl summer. Everybody wants to get that Benz now, which that's cool. Like enjoy it if you're getting it. But at the same time, you have to be intentional on the things that you do if you really want to enjoy it for the rest of your life. Hey, man, absolutely. I totally, totally understand where you're coming from with that. Now, why don't we just kind of dive a little bit into your background as far as, you know, so once you graduated from high school, what did you do, do after that? I went straight into a major university um, for one semester. I looked at that college bill and a student loan that came along with it. And I was like, nah, this is not this is not the move for me. Yeah. So I got out of there. I dropped out um, and I paid off my bill. So I had no debt going out of, you know, out of college. And then my brother got me a job in a plant. And so I worked at a steel plant and I always had a crazy work ethic. So I was working 116 hours a week, um, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, 100. And I, was, I think it was like 112, 116 hours a week. And I was making a lot of money. I mean, at 19 years old, I was making over $120,000 a year. I was making $118,000, $120,000 a year very early. But the, the, the interesting part was that um, I was balling. I was having a good time. I was taking 10,000 with me down to the casino. I was having, you know, across Canada, you can get in when you're 19 instead of 21 and all of this other type of stuff. And so, you know, me and my girls or whatever it was that I was interacting with, we was having a phenomenal time. So I was spending all of it. And an OG um, that I worked with, he was like, hey, what's going on, Anton, in the locker room at, at the job? And he said, yo, I need you to do one thing for me, young And I said, what? He said, put up a quarter of everything you make. I said, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a lot of money. I dog. And I was like, I, he said, trust me, fam. Trust me. Just do it. If you do whatever you want, if you don't hear nothing I ever tell you, put up a quarter of everything you make. So I started doing it. I started stashing away and. Um, investing a quarter of everything that I made. And so um, I wound up getting fired and I fell on hard times, but I never touched that money. Yeah. In my opinion, it was just like, it just didn't exist. It just didn't exist. It just had to work for me. So, you know, that money was compounding and making a lot of money, even while we were suffering, we lost everything, had to move back in our parents' house and all of that other type of stuff. Um, and then at that point, I decided that I wanted to turn what I thought was a hobby and the thing that I was having moderate success in into a full-time career. So I was a self-taught web developer. Um, I had sold an application around that point that had netted me some decent money that that put some money in our pocket, but going through what we went through instilled discipline in us. It's, it instilled the fact that, yo, we can survive or we can live um, and be moderately successful without being extreme and still having a lot of money. And so at that point, we evolved to the point to where um, I was working two jobs. I was working full time on two jobs and I was going to school online. Um, and then we started to build back up. And so at that point, um, once I graduated or I was about to graduate school, I got a, a pretty decent offer to work at the University of Michigan as a web developer. I quit my other two jobs. I finished school, but I was going to community college. That's the key. Yeah. So I enrolled in community college because I understood that the credit hours, it would cost me less in order to be successful. So I enrolled in community college. Um, I got my webmasters um, certification, web designer certification, um, graduated in software engineering, computer science, and then went over into the major university because the university was paying for my education at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in addition to getting all of the double matches and maxing out on everything and stacking and everything, I had, listen, you couldn't even get me to buy a car at that point. I had bought like a used Cadillac. We drove it up until like 300,000 miles. It was blowing black smoke. I I didn't. I had to get rid of it, but I was still stacking and I was being intentional and we was comfortable. We was comfortable with the idea that we had the option to buy whatever we want, but that didn't necessarily mean that we had to indulge. So eventually we moved out of our parents' house, you know, got a condo and then that's when I started getting into real estate. So I started buying properties up like, to this day, I own 10 properties. Um, so I own 10 residential properties. Those have skyrocketed in value. The mortgages are pretty much paid off because I did 15 year mortgages instead of 30. Um, I always put 20% down so I didn't have to do PMI insurance, which was more money that was going out the window. Um, and then I was just intentional. I never took on more debt that that forced me to pay, pay interest outside of um, investment. So there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. And then I started giving everybody else the game. Once I 
got a net worth that was well over a million and now it's in the multiples, um, I started giving everybody else the game as far as being able to understand how money works. People mm -hmm. don't understand how money works. They don't understand that um, it's important for you to have a business because the things that you're doing on a daily basis should be tax deductible, which goes against your adjusted gross income, which is the line that they tax at the end of your, your 1040 at the end of the year. Right. More money goes into your pocket. More money can be kept by you if you're doing the things that actually you turn the things that you feel like are a hobby into a real business, which you can then write off as a business expense. If you're a photographer, if you're a videographer, you be you need to be able to write off your computer. You need to be able to write off your camera work. You need to write off the mileage that you're using to go and film certain things. When you fly certain places, that should be a tax write off. All of this information that we are unwilling to um, gain or glean because we're so focused on who's the most popular on Instagram or social media. And that's the unfortunate part is that it's so much available to everybody, but people are unwilling to um, indulge or gain. So my, my journey eventually um, on top of that, I worked my way up to being vice president of user experience at a fortune 500 company. Bonuses was crazy, mm -hmm. right? When you get to that level, you don't even work for the base salary no more. You only work for, work for the bonuses. Um, and so we just stacked that. We stacked it. We got it. Anything that I bought, my toys, the things like you see the Jordans in the back, you see the Rolexes right here. Um, this goes up in value over yep. time. Yeah. Right. Those aren't worn. Those are actually worth more as a result of me not wearing them and using them as art than they were when I paid for them. You know what I'm saying? So all of these books that I listen, man, it's crazy. All of the books, they everywhere. Yeah. Shoes everywhere. And so I guess the point that I'm making is that it's important to be disciplined and instill principles than it is to be cool. Because the cool thing amongst people that have resources is people that have the option to do what they want to do, not subjected to what they have to do in order to survive. Absolutely, man. That's some good stuff. You dropping knowledge. If anybody is really paying attention, y'all can go ahead and ask any questions that you may have in the chat. And I'll go ahead and ask Mr. Daniels. You know, one thing I was watching a conversation you had with Kevin Samuels and you mentioned how often you fail. Yeah, that's my guy. That's yeah, my yeah. Guy. <laughs> For sure, man. I talk, to him. I talk to him every other day. That's my really? guy. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're dropping the knowledge as well, man. I, I, I really could appreciate what you mentioned about failure because a lot of people yeah. fail at a lot of things and they just take it negatively. They, they let it they let it break them. Yeah. But you you kind of turn you you flipped that around. Go ahead and tell us about how failure has turned you into a, a success story. I love failure. I think that's the best part of the the experience because failure is the thing that propels you forward. It's the thing that gives you the insight. Like, like I, I'll give you an example. There's things that I know from a business perspective, they don't teach you in business school. They can't teach you. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that's teaching these classes in business school have never really started a successful business. They went to school to be a teacher, yep. which means that they're just regurgitating information to you that that was that was taught to them. But as far as the things that I know and the understanding that I got, it came from real life experiences. So failure to a larger extent is the best teacher because it teaches you how to make adjustments and how to do things differently. So failure to failure for me, I embrace it because I understand that. So I'll give you an example. I probably failed. I would say maybe 30 times for every one success. Wow. But that one success is crazy. Yeah. So I want to hurry up. I call it the law of averages. I, I learned it when I was in sales and that you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to convince somebody that don't want your product to want your product, because mm -hmm. then you're preventing yourself from getting to all of the other people that could be potential sales. So I want to hurry up and fail fast. I want to hurry up and get through all of that stuff. So I can get to the person that actually wants my product, which is the same thing that I look at from a business perspective. If this thing isn't working, OK, what lessons can I take from it? How can I move quicker and get to that thing that's actually going to hit for me? And so that's how I embrace failure. I don't when I started my restaurant, my first restaurant, um, which now I'm not necessarily in the restaurant business on a day to day basis. I look at I'm a silent investor mm -hmm. and I give insight and information to the to the businesses that I invest in. Right. And it, it very well may be a restaurant. But um, when I went into the restaurant business, that literally was a plan that was hatched over the weekend. Like 
Thursday or Friday, I had talked to my grandmother that had some restaurants. I'm like, yo, what do you think about it? She gave me her insight. Saturday, I made up in my mind that I wanted to do it. Um, Sunday, I put together a plan. Monday, I went and met with real estate investors um, and people that own specific buildings that I had did business with before, signed a lease. Tuesday, I had bought equipment. Wednesday, I had it being shipped in. So like, I don't, I just jump. I'm yeah. not sitting here wasting time. It's just a million good ideas. Everybody's so so obsessed with the fact that, oh, somebody's going to steal my idea. You ain't going to do it anyway. <laughs> All you're going to do is plan for the rest of your life and dream for the rest of your life. But very few people actually do and implement. And that's the difference. I just don't have no fear. I don't yeah. have fear of failure. I don't have a fear of uh, falling or anything or what everybody else is going to think. I'm so driven by by the idea of being able to accomplish and do things in my work ethic, I feel like it's nothing that I can't accomplish. So failure is something that I embrace. And it's the thing that's actually made me super successful. That's a great point. When we were looking at doing our first flip last year, my wife actually told me, uh, scare of money don't make money. And I was like, yeah, well, it don't. It don't make money. I mean, you can sit there and be conservative with your money all day, every day, but it's not going to make you a lot of money. It's just like with the stock market. You could put your stuff in bonds and Yep. You know, it'd, it'd be somewhat safe, but it's not going to make you a lot of money. Well, that's not true. Well, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. Talk to us. That's man. not Talk true. To Talk okay, to so I, I'll tell you this. I, I look at myself as a pretty conservative investor, especially when it comes to the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. I don't look at the stock market like everybody else do. I look at it as um, an investment in a company in the same way that somebody would open up a restaurant or they would open up a car wash or they would open up anything. I'm buying into the shares of a company that I feel like is going to do really well. I understand the fundamental principles of that company. I understand. Let's just take, for example, Microsoft, my favorite mm -hmm. stock of all time has made me so much money. Right. And Microsoft pays a dividend, which means that every single quarter that they report profits, I, as an investor and a shareholder, according to how many shares that I get, get a quarterly dividend. On top of that, the company continues to explode. They're doing really well when it comes to cloud infrastructure. They've done it every really well when it comes to subscription-based services, such as Office 365, all of these different things, right? But the point that I'm making is that the most powerful thing that you'll ever run into or will make you money is not the businesses that you create. It's the compound interest that comes along with being an investor in a great company. So when you think about it, right, because a lot of people look at the stock market and they say, I want the stock to go up and down or whatever like that. It's a short term, ignorant view of what the stock market really is. I study Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. I, I very much refer to myself as a Buffettologist. Um, and what I learned very early is that Warren Buffett never really started any businesses. What he did was he invested in great companies. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was he he took Berkshire Hathaway, which was, okay, I'm not going to go into the whole that thing, but the name of the company is called Berkshire Hathaway. It wasn't what it is today. And Warren Buffett, and I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with who Warren Buffett is, but he's amongst one of the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he bought a an insurance company and he realized that the float money from insurance companies very much can be invested while um, all, everybody else is paying into it and then they need to report a claim. It's the same thing as banks. You put your money in a bank, the bank goes and invests it and makes more money off of your money while it's sitting in there, right? Which is why they don't give you a really good return on it it's sitting in a savings or a checking account. But the point that he realized is that it's the compound interest. So let's just say, for example, you take $6,000, right? And you set it in an account and the math checks out. You should do it. If you set $6,000 in an account and it makes on average between 10 and 15% in returns on a year to year basis. So let's just say, for example, your, your $6,000 makes a 15% return next year. And that essentially is what? 750, $900, right? So now you got $6,900 the next year. Mm -hmm. If you let that compound, which means you don't take that money out and you continue to let it reinvest itself, $6,000 alone over the span of a, over 30 years nets you over a million dollars just sitting there. $6,000 alone, which means that your money is working for you while you sleep. 
Yep. It's not what you do as far as the businesses that you start. It's how your money continues to work according to you being intentional and understanding what you're investing in versus trying to get rich quick. So when people tell me that um, money in a stock market will not make you rich, I will say that I've made more money as a result of letting my money sit and you're not being taxed. That's the key. Yeah. Your money is being reinvested. So I've made more money as a result of letting my money sit and continue to contribute to the stock market as far as the companies that I believe in and um, you know, the different investment strategies, having my fidelity advisors go over my portfolio every six months and things like that. I've made more money um, doing that than I have in any other space in my life, including real estate, real estate, the businesses that I've started the whole nine yards. Man, that's awesome. That's some good, good knowledge you're dropping right there. So let's let since we we are talking about the stock market, let's kind of dive into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I am more of a a JL Collins person, so I just put everything into index funds. You know, VTS. Okay. What do you think about index funds as opposed to you know trying to find those individual stocks? Um, I believe that index funds are cool. I think that index funds are less work. I like to have a balance in that. I like companies that I truly understand. So, for example, one of the things that I learned from Warren Buffett is that um, when you understand stuff, one of the things that he does, and I do this to this day, is he reads a lot. He spends the majority of what he considers work studying. He studies the financial reports from Ford back in like the 1960s and 70s because they had great years. And he's trying to figure out how he can duplicate that and use that. So he might go and buy Coca-Cola and then raise the price one penny. You know what I'm saying? Or he might go and buy Geico and then use that float money to invest in more more companies. Yeah. So my strategy as it relates to stocks is to truly understand the companies mm -hmm. and then develop a long term view, at least 10 to 15 years of me wanting to sit on that for an extended period of time because I understand that it's a growth opportunity. I invested in Amazon really early. I invested mm -hmm. in Tesla really early. I invested in um Apple way before they split. Microsoft has made more millionaires than, than practically any other company um, from the stock market in the United States. I invested in Netflix really early. I've never sold my positions in any of these companies because I got a long term view. Hold everything. I hold everything because why, why would I sell it if I truly believe I don't go with the ebbs and flows on a temporary basis of 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 how stocks are doing. I'll, gi I'll give you another example. Last year, now, think. look at my portfolio as a seven-figure portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. I did over 78% return as a result of continuing to buy in the dip instead of selling when everybody else was panicking in 2020 when the pandemic hit. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 78% return. Let's just take a flat million just yeah. for conversation purposes. That's $780,000 that I've made just off a flat million, let's just say, mm -hmm. in return for the companies that's been really awesome for me. Yep. Where are you going to get that from? Where are you going to no, get that? Where no can you get a 78% return in one year? I'm only looking for 12 to 15. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I know some people, they, they, you know, they think I'm a guru on finances, but they messaged me like right when the pandemic hit. And they were like, I'm going to pull my money. I was like, no, I don't do it. Just buy more. And they they pulled it. And it's like, man, they pulled it right yeah. at, at the bottom of the market. Well, everything is cyclical. If you study history, if you study the crash in the 80s, the dot-com bus in the, in the 2000s, the, the recession in 2008, everything comes back. Yep. It's all cyclical. And what, they, what people don't understand that rich people really do know is that Dips are buying opportunities, not a not a time that you panic. Any decision that you make under duress will ultimately lead to your demise. And you can use regular everyday experiences. If you want to use your favorite hip hop, use Tupac, right? Yeah. He signed a bad contract when he was in prison because he wanted to get out so bad and he was emotional when he was making a decision under duress that he that he signed a contract practically on a napkin. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you if you look at all of these cash advance places. They are in areas where people are making decisions based off of their current circumstances instead of paying attention to the idea of what it's going to do and impact them long term. It's the reason why cash advances thrive in deprived communities. 
Absolutely. And you never see it in a rich area of town. A hundred percent. It's a reason why they have show cars on the car room, on a, on a showroom floor. They Mm -hmm. want you to make an emotional decision because they understand that when you drive that car off the lot, it's going to depreciate by 10%. And that new car smell is going to work. It's going to wear off one day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the point is, is that when you make decisions under duress, panicking based off of what you see the market doing currently, instead of having that long term view and the discipline to be able to stick around long enough to see the benefits. You have far different results. It's a it's a a huge difference between the people that are successful in that circumstance and the people that aren't. That, man, some good knowledge you're dropping. As, as my man Don just said, he had a question, and we can go to that question before we continue. He said, is there anything on your journey that you would go back and change? Nope. Not one thing. I mean, it's I love the failures. Like, as anybody can go back and say, well, I wish I would have invested. No, nah, I wouldn't do that. Like, it's the things that I've learned that have given me the insight and the the wherewithal to make the decisions that I make today. The, the only thing that I would probably do is I would probably be even more adventurous. I would be more crazy. I would be crazier at an earlier age than I even was in a, you know, at the ages that I was. I would be more, I would fail faster. I would, I would be a lot more aggressive when it came to when it came to embracing the experiences. Um and I would have been even less cautious. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I would, have, I would have been a wild man. Yeah. If I can go back. And you probably be further along because of the, those risks you were taking. And I would have been a wild man <laughs> in every way, shape, and form because life is about experiences, not necessarily stuff. But at the same time, money and resources are great. A lot of people like to say, well, money isn't everything. Money gives you options. Let's be clear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Money enables you to be able to do the things that you want to do when you want to do them. And they don't make you a better person. It makes you more of what you already are. All right. So Ooh. you got to de- develop the character to go along with the financial resources. But money is awesome. I would have been a wild man. I would have done it even more. Well, and that's a great point, man. For my, my entire life, I never went to Disney World because of money. And now we're in a position <laughs> where in 2016, we just surprised the kids with a trip to Disney World. And it, it didn't impact our finances at all. You know? Yep. Yep. Now I spent my last three months. Well, the whole winter I was in Miami. Really? <laughs> and I'm never, I'm never doing snow again. Why would I ever do that? You know, I'm never doing snow again. That can't happen. No way. Wow. Yeah, I love Miami. That's where we got married in 2005. Great, yeah. great city, man. Great yep. city. Go back sometime. You know. Yep, I love Miami. <laughs> well, hey, I'm gonna go back to your your comments about community college. Now, you know, I'm a yep. I'm an administrator, so it's not really popular a lot of time when when you, you know, try to encourage kids, hey, go to community college for two years, save some money, save about fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars or, or or even if sometimes you might take a year off and discover, find yourself, you know, find out what yeah. you really want to do. Yeah. And it's not popular a lot of time with people. But, you know, just kind of speak on that. Like, what does that necessarily have to do with long term success? Well, the <laughs> this is so funny because, um, you know, going to community college for a few years and then transferring and not incurring that debt, our degrees say the same thing. But, you know, we have a, a culture that, you know, it celebrates and highlights the absolute wrong thing, which means that they're so focused on the thing that's popular instead of focused on the thing that's that's best. And so it's a it's a you know benefit now type of culture. Um, and what people don't realize is that community college is the way to success for the overwhelming majority of us. And the reason why it's not popular is because college in itself, especially from a young person's perspective, is largely based off of how they can have fun and not how they can be educated in the first place. Yeah. Which is why colleges don't even let you take real classes until junior year. Prove, yeah. Until you prove yourself after you did all of the core classes, which you paying for that. You're overpaying to be able to go out there and I'm going to just say it, go out and have a whole phase, for example. <laughs> like you want to go party. You want to go and do the things you so busy, focus on impressing your friends and all of that. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's it's unfortunate, but it's actually fortunate too because those learned lessons, 
the things that we should be implementing into our kids as a result of our experiences should be different from the things that we experience. Like our parents or maybe our parents' parents probably didn't even know any better, better because a lot of people are first generation as far as going to school. OK, cool. So you made a mistake. Are you going to hand that same narrative down to your kids? Are you going to let because my daughter, I had a conversation with her. My daughter never got a B in her life. She like. Dad, you went to community college, right? I'm like, yeah, she like that might be the wave. Like my daughter at 13 is very much already understanding exactly what it comes, you know, what comes along with. And keep in mind, my daughter manages her own portfolio since she was six years old and she's ever received allowance or birthday money. She's always saved 25 percent of everything that she's ever had. My daughter is richer than most grown folks from her own efforts and being intentional. She made because she very much um, followed my same path as far as her investment strategy in the companies. She just wanted to understand why we are why we are investing and what we invest in. She did a 78 percent return, too. Wow. Yep, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like my yeah. daughter very early was crying when I took her to um, she got her birthday money and she said, Dad, I want to get this. And this is back when she's like nine years old. I said, well, you know, if you buy it now, then you can use all your money to get it or I can show you how to flip that. She was like, OK, what took her to Sam's Club, had her spend her own money to buy all of this candy at a discount. She was crying like a little baby. I mean, dad, I ain't got no more money. I said, let's chill out. It's okay. We went to church. She sold all of that. We went to our neighbors. She sold the rest of it. She had made like a 500% return on her money and she was stacked. Since that day, she's been different. Her whole wiring is different. Uh -huh. She's looking at the trampoline park called the fire that she go to every day. And she was like, you know what? I could get a job. But I'm thinking about renting the whole, taking some of my money, renting the whole thing out and then charging everybody $15 to get in. What you think <laughs> about that? Really? Like, that's how she think now. She got a whole different mentality. So we doing ourselves and our children a disservice when we don't communicate to them the mistakes that we made and how they can do things differently. And one of the biggest things that you can do is talk to your kids about the benefits that come along with community college, because debt is the, is the, it's the antichrist of, su of success. Yeah. <laughs> you can't take a cup, put some holes in the bottom of it, and no matter how slowly it leaks, it's coming out, and you want to keep pouring water in it instead of plugging the holes first. The holes is the debt. Yeah. Get rid of the debt first. Get rid of that 20% interest that you're paying on your credit cards. Those student loans that you're going to voluntarily take and then complain to the government that um, they should forgive them. And that doesn't teach you a lesson. It just teaches you to continue to perpetuate bad behavior. It doesn't teach you not to no longer take out bad loans or to work during college or all of this other type of stuff instead of partying. You know, we need to be intentional as far as having these conversations. And it's one of the reasons why people resonate, why I resonate with people, because I'm going to show you. I'm yeah. going to show you the Rolexes. I take people to the stores with me to buy my stuff. I show you the shoes. I show you the, the Tesla that I bought my chick. Um, I just bought a penthouse that's off the water. We moving right now. The only thing that I got in this mug that's that's not broken down is my background. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to show you all the success, yeah, but at the sure. same time, I'm going to take you through and show you the failures and the journey along with it. I'm going to give you the whole story. And that's how people become more successful by getting an understanding and not necessarily by feeling their way through life. It's about being intentional. Gotcha. And, that, and is that what you do when you coach people on their journey? I kick their butts. <laughs> I am. Listen, I tell people from the very beginning, if you are uncoachable or you are easily offended, I am not the person for you because gotcha. I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you exactly who you are. I'm going to tell you, yo, if you out here for the streets, I'm gonna be like, oh, you for the streets. You're not trying to get married. Oh, you trying to look good instead of actually be rich, but you're really broke. You know that, right? Like, I'm going to tell you the whole nine yards. I don't pull punches because I got the information and the barrier to entry is humility. So I'm going to humble you, but I'm going to celebrate you when you do awesome things, too. Absolutely. But when you're not doing what you're supposed to do, don't think that I'm not going to hold you accountable. I don't play them games. Yes, I don't have time to be to be worried about my words and making you feel good. I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you what it is. Yeah. And you're not really being a brother or a, you know, a leader if you are telling people 
things that they want to hear rather than the things they need to hear. So yeah, people, that's why they don't like Kevin. They <laughs> they're, they're, Think about it. They, if you ask him and you say, okay, well, what is it that he's actually said that you disagree with? They'll always go back to his tone. Mm-hmm. I don't like him. I don't like how what he said. He didn't have to say it that way and all of this other type of stuff. Well, me, on the other hand, I'm trying to understand because me, like, you know, us in that type of circle and it's more of us, you know, we got friends and whatever, so on and so forth. We're so focused on trying to get the information that we're willing to humble ourselves, depending on what it is, you know, depending on who's saying it in order to get what it is that we need to get. Yeah. One thing that I always did that propelled me in, in, in corporate America is I would always go to my boss and say, yo, what do I need to do differently? Hey, how do I level up? Oh, okay. You know what? I'm about to volunteer for everything. I'm about to be nice. I got to suck up a little bit. I got to acknowledge this person. People do things because they like you, not necessarily because you do the best job or had the best product. So I'm okay with being humble if it re- if the results come along with it. I don't care nothing about that. That's pride. That's ego. I don't have none of that. Absolutely. You got to humble yourself, man. Absolutely. It's, it's about deference. Definitely about deference. Yep. So, you know, when we talk about educators and teachers, what's what's one piece of advice that you will give a, let's say a 22 year old teacher just graduated from college, probably got a little bit of student loan debt, but how would you tell them to secure the bag and, and prepare for their eventual retirement? A 22 year old teacher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you graduate 22, 23 years old and you just getting started. These people are getting off to a, a brand new, a fresh start. How would you tell them to prepare you know, throughout their career. I know that 25% is your magic number, correct? Yep. But you can but, start with 10 though. Start yep. with 10%. 10% of every pay your pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. Pay yourself first. And and the thing about it is that no matter what your profession is, um, the principles are still the same. So for example, pay yourself first. That's number one. Take advantage of every free opportunity that comes along with it. So if you, you know. I don't know the benefit structure or packages that comes along with teachers, but I heard that they're pretty generous as far as ensuring that you guys get a decent retirement or what's contributed or whatever like that. Take advantage of everything that comes along with it. Right. That's number two. Number three, do not raise your standard of living according to your income. Okay, Mm -hmm. make the adjustment in that when you get a raise or when you level up or when you start to go into the workforce and you're successful and you start to make money. Don't be so quick to do the things that society is saying that you need to do in order to show off or to project success or to project that you're doing things the right way. Don't make stupid decisions. Don't buy houses at the top of the market when they're getting 80 to 90 offers and then you overpay just to say you want that you own a home. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So the things that you want to do is be intentional. Make sure you invest in yourself. Continue to level up. Do not go to school for the sake of just going to school or to say that you're getting a master's or to say you're getting a doctorate. Do the cost benefit analysis and realize whether or not it's actually going to translate and you making that significantly significant, significantly more. Or are you spending an exorbitant amount of money just for the title? Don't do, don't do things based off of emotion. Every single thing that you do in life, take a business approach to it in a business perspective. That's what Man. I would tell you. I can appreciate that because I have seen people get a hundred dollar month raise. They had yep. paid off car and then they go yep. right out and get a you know seven hundred fifty dollar truck payment before yep. they get their first raise, before Absolutely. they get their first check. And, you know, I've seen that many times and I try to have that conversation. If they come to me, I'm going to be honest with them. But if they come to me after the fact, then, you know, there's nothing I can do at that time. I would also tell them to start a business. I always mm-hmm. say start a bit. Bu- I'll say I'll tell you this. I'll give you this, Jim. Every single thing, I would say 98% of everything that I purchase, it can be written off as a business expense. Everything, my printers, my TVs, every single thing that I do can be written off as a business expense. So when everybody else is paying, so you go to school or you go to work every day, not you specifically, but people, Mm -hmm. you go to work every day and you work for these little employees. These little employees is your dollars. So you trade your time, which is the biggest currency that you have, because you have a finite amount of it. You trade your time in order to get these little employees, these dollars. And then you take these little employees and you trade them in for stuff. Often at times, stuff that don't even add value to your life will depreciate over time. Stuff that make you feel good, 
right? So the interesting thing about it is if you think about interest and the things that you buy and you buy these things with credit cards and, and cars and all this other type of stuff, interest is literally taking the money, throwing it in a dumpster, pouring a gas a can of gasoline on it, and then setting a match to it. That's literally what you're doing with your money when you're paying interest. All right. So what I look at money and the way I look at money is completely different in that if I have to trade my time in for you, which is these little employees, you better go out there and start working for me. So every single dollar that I get goes into investing. And then I make decisions based off of not only for the not only the fact that I'm taxed at a lower tax bracket as a result of using the money that my money makes for me. Right. But also on top of that, I only spend the money that my employees bring back to me, not the principal. The principal is what I work for. Mm -hmm. The money that my money brings back for me, they working for that. Now I'm going to spend that, but the principal is mine. I traded in my time for that. Those are my employees. They're not going nowhere. I'm not giving nobody else my employees so they can work for them. Man, that's absolutely deep, man. That is, that's amazing. That's, that's exactly <laughs> how, that's how we need to look at it. You know, we need yeah, to look at it like there are, they are our employees. And I, I would tell you, I tell people this all the time. The most powerful day that we had in our financial journey was the day that we went into the black. Like we had when we went to yeah. the, a zero net worth. That was a powerful yeah. day. It and is. Then, you know, I mean, when you pay that final debt off, then everything after that is, you know, the, the net worth is just rapidly climbing because now we can invest into ourselves and not giving our money to Chase or Bank of America. I agree. You know, the interesting thing about it is that um, as much money, because I, I calculate my value based off of that, my net worth, right? As much money as I have or as much capital of I have as I have access to, as far as a regular checking account or savings account, at this very moment, I never have access to more than maybe a thousand, twelve hundred dollars on a regular basis. Yeah. Like as far as actual having cash available to me, now I'm liquid, right? I can go and move some stuff around and get access to you know three hundred thousand dollars within three business days and get it wired to me if I really, really needed it. Mm -hmm. But very rarely do I find myself needing anything more than maybe five hundred dollars within the two week span. Um, so within my actual checking and, and, and savings accounts and stuff like that, I would say somewhere around $1,200 at the most. Uh, that's I can respect that. What a, what a, <laughs> I'm, I'm cash poor, asset rich. I say that all the time. I'm cash poor, asset rich. <laughs> it's it's kind of, that's kind of where we are. Like I, people hit us up, they hit us up all the time, like thinking we have money falling out our pockets. But honestly, a lot of our net worth is in, retirement accounts and pension yep. and house yep. you know, things like that so it's not like i can just go to the bank right now and get fifty thousand dollars out i mean we got some stuff in in regular brokerage accounts with fidelity and vanguard but for the most part our yep. network is in you know, it, it's not that liquid you know yeah it don't need to be what, what <laughs> i mean but think about it the only thing i can think of and i tell people this all the time i was coaching a guy the other day uh this was actually probably like three weeks ago and he was like, man, I just feel like I need to have at least 40,000 available at any given time. And I said, OK, well, what do you what do you need more than a thousand dollars for on, a, on anything? Just in case of emergency. I said, give me an example. He couldn't think of one thing. The only thing that we can come up with is jail and you need to get bailed out. <laughs> oh, so, my, so my point becomes <laughs> he wound up moving like thirty eight thousand dollars into an investment account he already has started getting a huge return as a result of it, of it he was thanking his lucky stars he was thanking me like crazy but the point then becomes again what do we really need cash for why do we just have it sitting there because it doesn't even beat the rate of inflation which means okay. that your money is becoming less valuable every single day that you have it not working for you you don't want to have it in cash it's stupid it's silly Man, that's a great point. So what we used to do, we used to put money in a money market account to pay mm -hmm. for uh, to fu to fully fund our Roth IRA on the first of each year. So, you know, you put your thousand dollars into a money market account each month. Yep. And then when January 1st hits, you put it all in. But yep. somebody said, why are you putting in a money market account? The stock market goes up 75 to 80 percent of the time. Why don't you put it into into an index fund or, in, you know, into an investment? 
Yeah, like, yeah that, that doesn't make sense to do that. So it's already made more money than it would have made just sitting in a regular you know, yep. market account. So that, that definitely makes sense. That's true. Yeah. And, and the beautiful thing about it is, again, I mean, we probably don't have the time, but, you know, I talk about the business of marriage all the time. Like even with my wife not working. Right. I can still contribute on a yearly on a yearly basis um, money into an individual retirement account, regardless of whether she's working or not. For both of us, I get double the benefits from the investment perspective um, than I would if I'm just doing it from a single perspective. There's so many benefits that come along. And I'm not just talking about the tax benefits like me being me being able to if I don't have enough write offs, but then I can use her if Mary filing jointly in order to um, leverage going into a lower tax bracket in order to ensure our success, because all of those write offs also contribute to lowering my adjusted gross income in addition in addition to what I'm investing in these different retirement accounts. It's so many benefits that come along with being married just from a financial perspective. Absolutely. People have no idea. They have no clue. And, I, and I'll say this, man, just uh, I'm not trying to guess your income, but the fact that. Oh, I tell you, I made 1.2 last year. So if you made, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an open book. I, don't, I have no secrets. You you are an open book, and I saw that on the website. And, and the fact that you can make 1.2 and still contribute to in an IRA shows Absolutely. the kind of tax benefits, the tax deductions that you take advantage of. Oh man, I I I contribute to everything. I mean, listen, I'll say this: with all of the different businesses and ventures and people working for me and stuff like that. That 1.2 that I'm going to generate, I'm going to pay less on taxes than somebody that make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Hey, can't that's I, I can't I'm not I can't get that game out. They're gonna have to <laughs> they're gonna have to get coached up on that. But the point that I'm making is that <laughs> money is it's a game, man. Yeah, it's a and game. The more information that you have, the more you seek. The, the better the, the better that you make, the better decisions you make as a result. One day I'm about to Detroit Pistons. I promise you. Hey, man. And I, and I, I don't I don't doubt you, man. I, I'm going to buy them. <laughs> I've seen your drive, man. If you do end up getting the Pistons, man, go ahead and give me some tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy them. I'm going to buy them. I'm telling you. Man, I, I, I really appreciate this knowledge, man. I, one, another guy I've been really paying close attention to. I don't know if you know the, the Wall, Street, uh, Wall Street Trapper. Yeah, I know him. Man, I know he, he is. Good stuff. He dope. He dope. Really good but, stuff. But guess what? He's not ever going to be as popular as, say, um, name you whatever random, you know, rapper out here. But he has so much insight and game and knowledge, and it's so unfortunate. I mean, it's not unfortunate for the people that actually find the information or find him or find the value that he brings. But I'd rather spend, and again, this is the way that I was trained coming up. I'd rather spend the majority of my time embracing and gleaning information as a result of listening to content that he may have than any music or video where somebody is telling me how they ran up in somebody's house or how much they twerked last night. And I'm not saying that you can't do it, right? You know, have fun, do whatever you want to do, but but have a healthy balance in uh, favor of you actually being able to have more information that's beneficial to you coming into you versus you taking in all of the toxic things that add no value to your life. Absolutely. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Yeah, man. So I'm going to give you a few prompts. We kind of wind it down on time. I'm going to give you a few prompts. If you just want to you know, say a few things about, about that, we can go from there, okay? Yep, absolutely. Let's rock. All right. Minimalism. Um, It's everything. It's the thing that it's the thing that I am embracing more and more every day and that I'm realizing that minimalism extends beyond just your living, your living lifestyle, but it's how you approach everything. So for example, minimalism as it relates to investing, I've learned that it's good to have three or four different companies at max that you really believe in and that you invest in versus diversifying and having 10 to 20 and 30 different companies that you all, all invest in. And this is another principle that's embraced by all of the greatest investors, including Warren Buffett, and that if you understand a business and you minimize the ways in which you do things, and then that translates into everything that you do in your life, even how many cars you have, how many expenses that you have. A lot of people have no idea how many things are coming out of their account. They got eight different streaming services and they only use two. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Minimalism is life. It's a lifestyle that goes beyond how you live, but in the way in which you think, which translates into everything that you do. Absolutely. See, I, I, I can spit it. Don't do it. <laughs> I know you can, man. This is an hour show, but we if we kept going, we probably can go two hours, man. You got some. No, I can talk it. I can talk it, bro. Uh, let's talk about cryptocurrency. What you got? Just started investing in cryptocurrency within the last three months. Um, and the reason that I've just started investing in cryptocurrency is because I didn't understand it. So I truly live this life when I say I don't do anything that I don't understand. I don't just ride bandwagons because um, when I really started diving into it over a six month span, I started to understand the the impact of fiat currency and that the, the government, any government, not just the U.S., but um, any government's uh, current currency has to be backed by something in order for it to have true value. Now, because our, our current currency isn't backed by anything such as gold or, sp or precious metals, and the government can just print as much as it wants. Now, not only are you impacted by inflation, but the actual value of that currency is based off of people's belief in it, right? And people's belief in our current currency, such as the US dollar and all of these other different currencies, are waning because they're realizing that the government can just print more money whenever they feel like it, which ultimately raises the prices of things, which is i.e. inflation to a certain extent. So um, I'm investing in cryptocurrency. I'm currently investing about 25 percent of all of my future investments into cryptocurrency. I bought Bitcoin. I bought um, Ethereum and I've even invested in the recent IPO of Coinbase. So, okay. um, yeah, I think that cryptocurrency is a hedge against all of this fiat currency and wasteful spending and inability to be able to manage a government effectively and drive down the cost of goods as a result of being good money managers because we elect people that we like, not people that actually have a great understanding of business and money in itself. Gotcha. Gotcha. Why don't you look up safe moon when you get a chance? I just, yep. I'll check it safe. out. Okay. Yeah. And just let me know what you think when you get a chance. Yep. Finally, we're going to go with one more gentrification um gentrification is a sticky subject in a lot of people's minds because there is no true balance and the issue with gentrification is people the the people aspect of it is is it's it's twofold okay you're gonna have people on the one side that says you don't want to displace people but then you have people on the other side that says well how long is this place going to be in poverty and we don't invest in it so where's the healthy balance right yeah. Um, one of the things that I think that Detroit is doing really well is they're they're having um, the different places that's being built up because downtown Detroit has evolved beautifully. And they're saying, OK, well, if an investor want to come in and be a part of this particular area, then they have to allocate or designate a specific amount to people that may not make as much as the ones that's going to drive up the price of housing in this specific area. So. There has to be a healthy balance, but gentrification, in my opinion, is necessary, especially when you take into consideration or you look at these areas that is absolutely destroyed and is unsafe to live in. And there is no incentive for somebody like me to go in and invest and spend my hard earned dollars to help build up an environment or a community that's just going to be torn down or dogged out by the culture or the environment that's being perpetuated in that specific area. So it needs to be a healthy balance. I do think that Anything in its extreme, whether it's extreme on the negative side or extreme from, OK, well, we're going to drive the prices of this place up and drive all the people out are um, it's not good. But I do think that as much as people don't like it, gentrification to a larger extent is necessary, but it does not have to be negatively impactful if we manage it correctly and you have the right people in office that knows what they're doing as far as giving out these incentives for these companies to come in and build up a specific area. Man, some good stuff, man. <laughs> good stuff, man. Hey, we can keep doing this, man. <laughs> uh, listen, listen, when we talk about money and all of this, this is what I do. This is yeah. This is this is my talent. I mean it's I almost feel like you know some people was blessed with height or run fast or all of this other type of stuff. I was just best with business acumen. Absolutely. And, and work ethic. That was my how many, time. How many streams of income do you have at this time? Probably about seven. About seven? Yeah, okay. I would say seven. Seven in that um, I don't look at the different. So, for example, if you say, okay, well, Anton, you're a silent investor in four different restaurants and three of them are profitable right now. I don't count those three 
as different streams of income. That's one company. I have one company that's set up to manage um, a Dan Capital, which, which is set up to manage all of my silent investments and angel investments in different companies. So that's one stream of income. Then you may have another stream of income as it relates to this company, which is a Dan Media. A Dan Media is the company that generates all of the revenue from the licensing that we do from shooting uh, original content to the different YouTubers that we've signed to, um, um, you know, all of that, the sponsorships, the, the YouTube revenue, all of that. That's another stream of income. Then you got real estate. That's a, it's, it's its own entity. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. when I say seven, that really very well may be a hundred that's consolidated from a business perspective into one company or seven different companies. Much respect, man. You're doing some big things. Keep it up. <laughs> man, I, I, you drop some gems, man. And I'm going to play this a, 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 a few times. I'm going to upload it on YouTube. I'm going to keep sharing it on Facebook. And anybody who's tuned in, if you could do the same thing and share this video. I mean, it's, it's some great knowledge. Why don't you give give everybody some more information on how they could find you, how they could follow you, any other businesses that they can help you know, invest in? So for me, it's easy to find me. Just go to AntonDaniels.com. It's right there. Just go to AntonDaniels.com. Every way in which you want to communicate with me whether it be on Facebook or Instagram, or you want to email me, or you want to join the email list, or you want to join a Patreon or anything like that. All of the information in which you can contact me is right there on my website. I'm an easy guy to get in contact with. You know, you hit me up like Anton, come through. <laughs> I want you to do this. And I'm like, yes, cool. Yeah. Let me know the date and time. I lock it into my calendar. I'm there. You ain't even have to follow up with me and say, yo, we going to do, are you still a bit? No, I'm there. I'm there. I am well, a regular dude exactly like everybody right. else. I rock with y'all. I love y'all. And anybody that I can give game to, I don't care if it's one person, I don't care if it's 50,000 people. I am going to give everything I have as far as pouring into the people that want the information because my current, my true currency is people. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's, that's where my legacy is. It's in people. My brother, man, I salute you, man. I, I really appreciate your time. I with you, fam. <laughs> keep, keep doing big things and we'll definitely be in touch, my man. Absolutely. All right, man. Hey, you have a good one. You too, bro. All right, later.